please use the chat box to say hello, say where you're coming from. Uh, and if you've got any questions throughout the event, uh, don't hesitate to ask, just type it in. Uh, we'll come back to you um, when the time's right and we'll maybe uh, get a few people unmuted to ask their questions in person if they're comfortable to do that. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for joining um, this uh, Japanese book club event. Uh, it's great to be back at the Stay at Home Fringe Festival. Um, and today we're going to be talking um, about writing Japan. Uh, so we've got a panel of excellent authors uh, with us, um, a memoirist, uh, a, a novelist, and an historian. The, the memoirist of our group um, is the University of Glasgow creative writing alum, uh, Ian Maloney. He's the author of the critically acclaimed The Only Gaijin in the Village. Uh, it's a memoir about his life in rural Japan. He's also published three novels and a collection of poetry. And in 2013, he was shortlisted for the Dundee International Book Prize. Um, he's also a freelance editor and journalist, uh, mainly for the Japan Times. Our novelist uh, today is Nick Bradley. Uh, he's worked in a variety of jobs, including Japanese teacher, English teacher, video game translator, travel writer, lecturer, and photographer. He speaks fluent Japanese and has recently completed a PhD um, funded by the Great Britain Sa Sasakawa uh, Foundation in creative and critical writing at the University of East Anglia. And he was focusing um, on the figure of the cat in, in Japanese literature, which is kind of appropriate um, because his novel uh, and the BBC Radio 2 book club pick, The Cat in the City, um, is obviously it's centered around a cat and it's a fantastic read. Um, our historian is Dr. Christopher Harding. Um, he's a cultural historian of modern India and Japan, and he works as a lecturer in Asian history at the University of Edinburgh. His book, Japan Story in Search for a Nation, 1850 to the present, was a huge success. And in early November this year, just a couple of weeks, um, he is publishing a new book, The Japanese, A History in 20 Lives, which sets out to create a portrait of modern Japan through a biography of its people, a history distilled into the stories of 20 remarkable individuals. Um, yeah, and I think we'll just go straight ahead. As I said, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, to just write them in the chat. Uh, but I think it might be appropriate to start by asking each of our panelists, um, can you give us some background as to your interest in Japan? Uh, what drew you to the country? What made you want to write about it? Uh, Nick, you seem to have found a real connection to his literature, or at least to the cat as a common literary symbol in Japanese writing. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that as well. Okay, uh, right, well, uh, thanks for Thanks for having me, um, University of Glasgow, and uh, thanks to everyone who's tuned in. Uh, it's great to be on this panel with um, a couple of really interesting writers. Um, so how did I get interested in Japan? Um, I think it, it all sort of started when I was uh, at university and I'd just done a master's degree in English literature. And back then I, I used to be a medievalist, so I wrote my thesis on Chaucer. And I was thinking about doing a PhD but my professor said to me that I was a bit young and that maybe I could go and see the world and do some things. Um, and I'd always wanted to be a writer ever since I was a child. So I thought, well, I'll go somewhere, I'll go somewhere different or what I thought would be different. Um, so yeah, I went out originally on jet uh, and I was based in rural Hiroshima. And I originally, I was just going there for one year, but um, I sort of fell in love with the, the language and, and the culture and ended up staying there for four years on jet. And that was my path to becoming a, a translator. So then I went on to work for a few Japanese companies and I ended up in Tokyo uh, working for a, a Japanese travel agency. Um, and I used to travel around the country and sort of take photos of tourist destinations and then come back to Tokyo and then make websites for um, different tourist boards and things. Um, so yeah, that was my, route into falling in love with Japan. I didn't plan it. Um, 
it was kind of random. I just went somewhere different and, and sort of fell in love. Um, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll let the others deal with that. And Ian, would you like to go ahead? Um, my, my interest in Japan started by moving to Japan. I kind of, in a way, ended up here a little bit by accident. Um, as you mentioned at the start, I did the um, creative writing masters at Glasgow. And it turns out that while that's absolutely brilliant, if you want to be a writer, um, in the job market in 2004, it wasn't the best thing to have. So I sort of graduated and really didn't know what I was going to do with myself. Um, I had a very, very bad novel that was never going to get published and not much money. And it was actually my dad who said, well, why don't you go abroad and teach? Why don't you go to Japan? He, he was the one who was kind of big into Japan. He loved watching the Shogun series and, and things like that. Um, and because I was staying with him rent free for the time, I went, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll apply for jobs in Japan. Just, you know, don't, don't cut me off. Don't throw me out. And, um, I got a job at, uh, Nova, um, who existed at the time and, um, came out here with the intention of staying for a year and then moving on probably to Korea or Vietnam or something like that. And, uh, I'm still here 15 years later. So, yeah. Nice. And, and Chris, would you like to tell us? Um, yeah, it's a difficult question for me because I only have the very unfashionable answer of escapism to give you since I was very small, all these different forms of escapism uh, that I indulged in turned out to be Japanese in origin. So the anime series, I was trying to remember the name, I think it was G-Force in the American version, which is Gacha Man in the original Japanese. There was that, and then there was all the tourist board stuff of lovely lush green paddy fields and zen monasteries and all this kind of thing um and finally when i was at university undergraduate we did this best job i've ever had a month where japanese university students came over to the uk we taught them english we toured them around the uk and then we toured them around europe and they're just some of the most wonderful people i'd ever met and they had fascinating technology flippy mobile phones which at the time was was fascinating to me um and so I wanted to go and see where they came from. And I took a trip to Japan and uh, yeah, uh, that was it really. That sort of got me, that got me hooked in. Nice. Yeah, I think all of us here can relate to the escapism element of it, I think. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I wonder, did any of you feel at all that writing about another country or, or culture has changed your views on the country or did it open up something uh, new within yourself even. Uh, Ian, did writing your memoir in, in any way help you to find your foot, footing in rural Japan? Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 on you go, sorry. It, it did to a certain extent, yeah, because um, writing the memoir, because it's writing about my own life, my own experience, it's sort of doing um, what Wordsworth describe poetry as being you know, the emotion reflect uh, recollected in tranquility it was going over experiences that had been kind of anecdotes that i tell my friends and things i talk about and maybe um laugh about on twitter or facebook or something and actually writing about it made me sit down and really think about kind of my motivations and my experiences going through and going through those time those events but also maybe what my neighbors were thinking or what my wife's family were thinking and kind of analyze it in in much greater depth and detail and um yeah i think i think that definitely had um that was definitely a, a large part of it um i think though like to, to, sorry your, your main question i think every writer um we write in order to learn in order to certainly i write in order to answer questions things that that i want to find out about i mean you know kind of superficial example but my my last novel the waves burn bright i made the main character a geologist because at the time i was really into learning about geology and i wanted an excuse to buy more books about geology and learn more stuff about geology and that you know that that made a big difference um but yeah it definitely um, just the very act of sitting down and thinking about things and then having to structure them and shape them and put them on the page definitely change things. I don't know how the other guys feel. Yeah, uh, Nick, I'm wondering as well, um, so Ian chose the kind of memoir route 
uh, to to go into his love of Japan. Uh, I'm wondering why did you choose uh, fiction for that for yourself? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I, I'd say, well, first of all, sort of g g that previous question about um, did writing about Japan change my opinion or my views on Japan? Um, I, don't, I don't think it did for me because I think the vehicle of fiction is very much about setting up something different to yourself. So my book is not about me and it's not about my, my ideas of Japan. It's, it's more about trying to capture different voices or different perspectives of Japan. Or in, in my case, I think not so much Japan, but Tokyo in particular, um, because I think, you know, writing about Tokyo is a different beast to writing about rural Japan. Um, but I would say though, that my time in Japan, uh, when I moved out there, like learning the language, I think that really affected my writing on a sentence level. Um, I think that when I look back on stuff I wrote before I moved to Japan, um, I always think that the, the syntax was too like convoluted. Uh, my sentences were too, they were trying to do too much um, with language. And I think the act of studying Japanese and sort of starting again from zero and trying to learn to communicate with a very kind of simple uh, vocabulary, which, which I had when I first moved there. I think that taught me something about how you could actually convey big ideas, but with very simple language. So I, I really am indebted to my time in Japan for teaching me how to write, um, if that makes sense. Did, did that answer the question? Um, I'm not yeah. sure if I did or not. I, I think it did very well. It's, it's almost the uh, opposite of uh, Haruki Murakami then. He um, looked to English to try and peer back all the, the Japanese kind of um, description and, 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 and motive elements in the writing um, yeah. to find a new rhythm. Yeah, yeah d and definitely like, I mean, I think I've, I've talked to other people about this, but um, my, my characters for me, they spoke in Japanese and I translated them into English. So, I mean, I would say that the, any, any time there's narratorial voice, that's just sort of from scratch. But in my head, all my characters were speaking in Japanese. So I was trying to find a register of English that would suit the way that they were speaking in, in Japanese. So some of my characters speak with a more kind of British, uh, uh, sort of clipped formal way of speaking. Some of them speak with a bit more of an American um, lilt. So yeah, I, I, I was definitely trying to do that with my characters, trying to represent them in English in the way that I heard them in my head in Japanese. That's brilliant. That's interesting. Um, and, and Chris, I suppose you had, um, perhaps not a more intense, but you, you certainly had to delve into the past uh, to write Japan story um, and your no, no, uh, book, The Japanese. Um, how did that kind of affect your, your views of the country? It's an interesting one because I, I managed to live in Japan on and off for quite a while without really understanding very much about what I was seeing around me. I think I'm quite, a, probably distinct from, from Ian and Nick, I'm quite a bad traveller and quite a bad resident. I can live some, I lived in uh, Shimokitazawa, you know, the neighbourhood in Tokyo for a while and everything around me, it felt very contemporary. And my, my grasp of what was going on around me was quite superficial. And I think I could have lived in Japan for years and years and years without really understanding where anything around me had its origins, where any of it came from, apart from seeing you know, a vague idea that Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples are fairly old. Um, and lots of the built environment in Tokyo, of course, was destroyed in the war. So you don't get the sense always walking around a place like Tokyo of history shouting at you, you know, so you have to kind of go looking for it. So. I found actually going back and forward between being in Japan and going away and reading about it and researching the history and then looking at Japan afresh with those eyes, you notice things. So I think it, it helped me to appreciate being in Japan more, having gone away and found out how everything got there. I mean, to an extent, my book isn't quite that comprehensive, but I think that's my approach. Otherwise I'm not, yeah, I'm not the kind of person who notices things. I would be a very, very bad travel writer. So instead, my approach is to go away and do some reading and then try and structure it so that it makes sense to me. And then hopefully it makes sense to other people as a result. I would say that's my approach. Yeah. Um, so um, I suppose, Chris, as well, how did you uh, manage to communicate Japan in your writings, uh, Japanese stories to an English audience? And each of you, to a degree, um, 
we all bring a degree of university universality to the to the topic or the Japanese setting. Uh, Nick, your stories are emotive and relatable. Ian, we adjust uh, through your Western eyes. But Chris, you in particular must have thought long and hard about how to engage the reader um, because you're quite directly educating us uh, on another culture. Um, did that, by putting uh, a particular focus on individuals, mm. especially in the upcoming book Japanese, um, was that a way of trying to find uh, trying to find a way of carrying Japanese history's appeal? Yeah, I suppose because I um, trained in first Indian history and then Japanese history, to put it bluntly, that these are both places where there's a kind of modern history of, 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 of white middle class people going out and telling people how things are and uh, perhaps not always being very sensitive about the place they're dealing with. That's not the position we're in now, but I mean, you know, think back to the perhaps the Victorian era, um, early Edwardian era, uh, a lot of travel writers perhaps not taking the most sensitive tack. So one of the things I wanted to do, I think an outsider view on a place can be very useful. I don't, wouldn't buy into the idea that you can't possibly write about a place um, if you don't come from there. Um, but I wanted to try to show people what the country looked like from a combination of, of my point of view as a historian, but also the point of view of people who were in that place at that time and how their lives were being affected by what was going on. So to give just one very brief example, in uh, the Japanese, the book that, that's coming out shortly, one of the 20 is Shibasawa Eichi, the so-called father of Japanese capitalism. And he's great because he's growing up, he's a young man at the time of the uh, Commodore Perry, the Americans coming to Japan in the 1850s. Um, all these big questions about how Japan is gonna open up to the world and what they're gonna do and whether you need to get rid of the old leadership or not. And he's fascinating because he ends up first taking up arms, collecting some weapons. He wants to go and fight the Westerners. Then he goes to Paris and learns about European Western technology. Then he comes back and he starts to pioneer banking systems and factories and all the rest. So in a single life, you can get both a person's reaction to the world around them. They sort of parachute you directly into that place and time. And at the same time, you can smuggle in all these elements of the history that I want to try to communicate to people. So you get to do both. You can try to be faithful to the time and place via a particular person. And you can also, as I say, smuggle things in, which if you put them in cold historical terms, in the end, people might start to perhaps get a little bit bored. You can have, I suppose you can have legitimate drama without making things up, which as a historian, you know, you're not really supposed to do. So you try and get the best of both worlds, I suppose, that way. Um, and anyone else? Ian, how, how do you feel? Um about trying to communicate Japan in your writing? I don't know. I mean, for me, um, I don't know if I am trying to communicate Japan in a certain sense because it's a memoir. I'm sort of just directly communicating my own experience. I think you said in your question, it's like looking, the readers are looking through my eyes and experiencing it. So it's... <sighs> From a writing point of view, it's very route one. It's you know, it's it's um, Dante being guided into into hell and shown things. It's that. It's me standing here going, I don't understand what's going on. Someone please explain it to me, and slowly learning. So people, you know, the readers learn as I learn what's going on. And um, what what I find really interesting, just to to flip it slightly, um, onto Nick, is that Nick and you in your book. With the exception, I think, of one character, um, all of the, the first-person narrators are Japanese characters. I think, it's, I think Flo is the only one who isn't. And you said you, you heard them speaking to you in, in Japanese in your head. How did you find the experience of, of writing all those, all those characters, um, all those Japanese characters? Because um, not to cast this person on yours, I've read other books by writers, by non-Japanese writers who've tried to make um to do narration first person narration from a japanese character it hasn't always worked out very very well but you do it excellently um how how was it wow yeah that's a really tough question um oh first of all i wanted to say i love your pearl jam t-shirt i'm a big fan of pearl jam mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um oh so i think it's it's difficult isn't it um one one of the things that I really loved about um, doing my PhD in Japanese studies 
um, not not Japanese studies uh, hardcore, but I was part of the Japan studies uh, research community. One of the things that I kind of learned in the UK um, and in Europe when I when I went to conferences and things was that people were constantly reinforcing the idea that look, Japan is not unique. You know, it's often depicted as being unique, and and people like to look at the differences between Japan and the rest of the world, but actually. There are so many similarities, and I think that that hearing so many academics saying that actually really kind of frees you up when you start writing because you think, well, of course, you know, everyone comes from different backgrounds. But I mean, for example, like say Norwich. Uh, I'm not born in Norwich, but um, there are tons of people around me who grew up in Norwich. But I could go um, around uh, the city centre doing a kind of questionnaire and asking people about their lives and, and how, you know, what Norwich was like for them. And I would come back with millions of different answers because everything is a kind of uh, a, a subjective um, lived experience. And so I think one of the keys to tapping into writing about anyone is just thinking about like what we have in common. and. And how would that feel? And I think that that's one thing that fiction does is it tries to empathize. You try to look into, say, for example, um, I mean, one of my characters is, is like shocking. He's terrible. He's, uh, he's a psychopath. Um, and that's one thing that memoirs don't do so much. They don't tend to show, um, you know, the psychopath because perhaps the psychopath doesn't want to be honest about their, their true feelings. But I think, you know, when writing fiction, you can start to think, well, how would a psychopath think? You know, how, how might I depict that? And I think that that's what fiction is. It's, 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 asking, it's asking the reader to sort of believe in magic a little bit. It's asking them to suspend their disbelief and just sort of buy into this thing that's not real. Um, but you're trying as a writer, you're trying to create this illusion that it is real. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but... I think when writing about Japanese people, I think, well, it's no different to writing about women. Uh, I don't approach writing women to a different, you know, it's a different, that's not a different experience for me, writing about a woman uh, as it is to writing about a man. I, I think you approach it in the same way. You think, what does this person want? They're a human, they have desires, you know, they want things, they want their lives to take a certain trajectory. And I think I do that with all characters. I think I, I look at them, uh, all the same as a species we're all human we all need things um i know obviously like th th there'll probably be disagreement with what i'm saying but uh, i think that's how i approach writing yeah i, I just want to say not all memoirists are psychopaths I want to make <laughs> <part of it. laughs> yeah no it's it, it was it's really interesting what you're saying that because reading it the you were talking about them the characters speak um japanese um, in in your head, and you try to translate it and use different voices and things like that. But um, it really came across on the page. I was reading it because it's something I've I've come across, uh, co yeah, come across myself in writing before. Is people going, oh, but you've you know, I, I wrote a book written in the set in the Second World War, and a few readers were like, oh, they sound very modern. The language is is very modern. And reading yours, I was like the the language the characters talking is very sometimes it's very british sometimes it's very american it's got that kind of there's a slang quality and a natural quality but it works perfectly because it is natural and it's it, it is kind of if you could translate it that's kind of how it would sound like but so many fiction writers in writing about japan try to sort of try to replicate japanese in english and it really doesn't work most of the time um, and you didn't do that which you know I was, I was curious about your process so Thank yeah that, that's that's a really good observation i think it kind of ties into the discussion with historical fiction too you know um, writers who try to write this authentic um authentic language of the time which would be quite difficult for modern readers or people who say right I'm going to update that I'm going to try and just take the spirit of it and I think from working as a translator too there's that debate in translation this the sliding scale of creative versus literal and I think some re I think this is also where it comes down to readers tastes or, or an artist's tastes some people like that idea of authenticity and, and literal translation and some people like you know just being able to relate to the emotions or, or the, uh, the spirit behind things 
what uh, Walter Benjamin called um, the, the pure language behind things. Yeah. Can I, sorry, I'm hijacking this off you, Reese, but <laughs> Chris, um, how do you feel about it? Because Chris, in, a, in Japan's story, you, you get into psychology quite a lot, the kind of what character, what people were thinking in history either individually or sort of collectively and i'm assuming i haven't obviously read your new book because it's not out yet but i'm assuming because it's based on lives that you really do dig into that um how did you find that side of things it's, it's always a tricky one because you <clears throat> i find that when you're when you're writing about these characters you build up a picture of what they are like certainly what they've done and to some extent what their inner life is like if they left their own memoir, diaries, letters, whatever it might be. But then there's always the temptation to, or almost not even a temptation, almost automatically to start filling in gaps. You know, if I've got a character who behaved in this way at one point, I said, well, she was probably then thinking that or, or, or planning to do that later on. Then you have to go back to the material and say, is that actually true? Do I actually have any kind of grounding for that? Because I want to try to produce the history in a way that's dramatic and engaging, but still firmly rooted in what I can certainly know. I think the other issue for historians when we focus on lives like this, actually my editor said this at Penguin, he said, be really careful you don't end up using any one person as a cipher. In other words, you know, so I, 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 it would be very convenient if you're trying to distill a country's history into 20 lives, if some of those 20 people do particular things or thought particular things or usefully represent something that was, you know, maybe the zeitgeist, often people are inconvenient and they, they don't. And you have to be honest about that. Otherwise you are abusing a person's life and you are straying. I mean, I, I sometimes think one day to do some kind of historical fiction would be nice, but I think I've always got to be careful of the, the genre that I'm actually in. Otherwise, you can start to write something that might be quite engaging, but it's one of those things, if you start to lose trust in the person um, in the person you're hearing from, then at some point you're going to put down the book, you know, if you don't think you can believe them, if they've made one too many mistakes early on, you think, actually, that's me, I'm going to go and find a more reliable historian of Japan. So the temptation to sort of slightly fabricate these people uh, is always there, and that's what the editing process is, goes about, going back and thinking, actually, do I know she said that? Do I know she thought that? Um, so hopefully people can rely uh, on the final product, fingers crossed. Uh, Chris, just to, to read a bit of your, your book back to you, um, you've got a great bit very early on um, where you say, a good story offers purchase on life, and, through, and though a story may give shape to a single life or nation, it risks doing so at the cost of a steady loss of the ability to see, think, and imagine otherwise about oneself or one's home. Mm. I think, does that kind of tie into what you're saying as well, uh, a little bit? I, th I think so. I think it also ties into something that um, Nick was saying, and I was really glad to, to hear you saying it, Nick, that writing about Japan from a Japanese point of view, you begin with what you have in common. Because I think when I started writing about Japan, Japanese friends of mine would say, you'll never get a job in Japan teaching Japanese history, being a foreigner. There was still a pervasive view, and I think Ian and Nick will know better than me, you've spent more time there recently than I have. Um, the extent to which this may or may not still be true, the idea of a foreigner having, likely having their own particular take on Japanese history, or missing something about Japanese history. There was this idea, um, and it, it go, it was, I think it was prevalent into the 1990s in Japan, that um, you know, the whole Nihon Jinron idea that there is something sort of special and unique and, uh, about Japan and that you can't legitimately understand Japan or, or criticise Japan unless you are sort of, as it were, part of the club. And that's one of the stories that I had in mind, Reese, to go back to that quote, the idea that Japan is uh, special and different and then it goes down to the level of sort of psychology, I mean, even biology and nutrition and climate, some people would love to claim. Um, it's those kinds of stories that I think can have that really limiting effect um, and so the more that we can try to get around and recognize the diversity of Japan as a place we've been talking about that and also recognize the idea that with the appropriate humility people from outside Japan have a lot to contribute in terms of understanding the place and, and sharing uh, some of what's interesting about it. I hope, I mean I wonder what Ian and Nick would say to that, I hope we're not perhaps in that place anymore where there is that sense of of not having legitimate things to say about Japan if you if you don't have 
three or four generations in the graveyard, as it were. Perhaps we've moved on from that, or perhaps you two have bumped up against it. Um, can, I, can I answer that with a question, Chris? Um, are okay. either of your books going to be translated into Japanese? Ah, oh, that's a good, <laughs> good question. Yes, we had, this would be a little story. So we had um, a back and forth with a couple of publishers on Japan Story. One really interesting thing came back. They said, we like the book, but people in Japan at the moment are feeling, for want of a better expression, a bit down in the dumps about Japan's prospects. And they want a book, basically they want a history of Japan that is a fanfare of the country's achievements and fascinating future prospects. Whereas Japan Story, part of what it tries to do is, is give that narrative, but also the darker side people who've questioned it, people who want to reshape what Japan is all about, they said actually what that adds up to for potential readership is yet more bashing of Japan by outsiders. And thanks very much, but we're not sure of Japan bashing books uh, written by outsiders. So yeah, there's a struggle there. Yeah, well, because that, that, that's where I've encountered it. Like you're saying that, yeah, things have changed and stuff, but in publishing in Japan, in my experience, it is still there and there. Yeah, we, we have enough history books about um, Japan or we have enough stories about what it's like living in Japan. We don't need to translate your ones. We have those. There's, there's been a bit of pushback there. And how about it's you? Hard. My wife had a good, she's, she's from Okayama and she's a bibliophile. She knows her Japanese publishing industry quite well. She said the only way you could really sell a book like that would be explicitly, this is a Westerner's view of Japan. If you're interested in what a Westerner might think about Japan, then buy this book it can't possibly be marketed as superior in sort of purely intellectual or objective terms to what a Japanese person might come up with. Yeah. Maybe she's right. Maybe we'll try that. Yeah. I, I was told you have to achieve bestseller status in the United States and then they'll consider it. So that sounds familiar as well. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Ian, you make a, just on this point of the outsider, um, you, say um in the only gaijin in the village uh that you're not an expat um and that's kind of an important shift in perspective i think that you're you're an immigrant uh a gaijin and, and it's not japan that's kind of foreign and strange in your story it's it's you that's kind of uh, foreign and strange um but can you tell us a bit more you're welcome. <laughs> but can you tell us a bit more kind of about this distinction and about how it affects your writing? Part, I mean, part of it is just, is just a linguistic point that um, when it, the word expat is used, it's usually used um, to differentiate between good immigrants and bad immigrants. Um, it's, it's an aspect of white privilege to a certain extent of, um, you know, expats are, are good, immigrants are people we should be trying to keep out of the country. And that really annoys me. That linguistic difference has always annoyed me, um, not, not just in Japan. So I don't like the word and I, I refuse to use it. And um, yeah, that, that's kind of what started there. But it also, writing about, writing about my experiences, writing about living in Japan, it, for a start, it was something I didn't particularly want to do in the first place. There are a lot of very, very bad books out there about, hey, I'm a foreigner living in Japan, and either it's, um, I'm 23 years old and I've just come to Japan, and isn't Tokyo crazy, and there's karaoke and kanji and sushi, and isn't it mad? Or there's a subgenre of foreigners complaining about Japan, and here's what I don't like, and here's what's wrong, and here's what's wrong. And I, you know, I didn't want to do either of those things. So for a long time, I, I didn't want to write about it. And when I finally, you know, long story short, when I finally decided I was going to do, do a book, one of the things I wanted to do was stay as far as I could away from, um, from the idea of, I didn't want my privilege to show, I suppose, in a certain way. I'm, I'm British, which in Japan, I've got a British passport. I've been in, immigration centers where um people have like the, the staff have tried to get me to skip the queue because i've got a british passport so that's easier to deal with there's less problems stuff like that i'm middle class i'm white i'm male i'm straight i've got all these privileges and the last thing i wanted was to write a book where either i was just going on about isn't it great living in japan because it's easier for me to live in Japan than it is for um, a 
worker from a guy from Vietnam who works in the convenience store or a factory worker from South America in Toyota working in the factories there. I wanted to kind of acknowledge that and include that and embrace that in, in a way. Um, so part of what I wanted to do before I even set out in the book is to just deflate that idea of there are expats, there are immigrants, there's me and there's the guy from Vietnam working in the in the convenience store. Whether or not I did it is something that other pe- readers can can work out um, for themselves. But um, yeah, that, that's sort of why I declare war on <laughs> the word expat in my book. Um, but it's also there's also a status thing when when we're writing, and, and part of this, like Chris was talking about the um, the outsider writing about Japanese history and having having that perspective which is is a valid perspective but is is an outsider's perspective there's a thing i've learned a bizarre amount about writing and about also about teaching from listening to podcasts about stand-up comedy (laughs) particularly particularly Stuart goldsmith's comedians comedian podcast which i recommend to everyone stand-up comedians talk about a lot about status when you're on stage doing a stand-up comedy set, you're, you have a status. So if you're a comedian like Jimmy Carr, you're a high-status comedian, you're rich, you're successful. Um, so he, his performance, he can be kind of haughty and condescending. Or you can have a low-status comedian, somebody like, I don't know, like Joe Wilkinson or somebody who's kind of a bit, a bit of a mess and a bit, you know, the audience can sort of look down on him to a certain extent. And I think, certainly with my book, if I had been high status in the book, it wouldn't have worked. I'd have come across as a condescending prick. Just right, here's all the things that I don't like about Japan, and here's some funny stories where I come out as the good guy. Would never work. Nobody would want to read that, and I wouldn't want to write that, and I wouldn't want anyone in the world to ever think that I was that kind of person. So to write the book, for that book to ever work, I have to be lower status in a sense so um so like it's a it's a funny book there's a lot of humor but it's all self-deprecating i'm always the one who comes out of situations worse um yeah so i don't know <laughs> drifting off the subject to, to a certain extent but yeah i i think all of that is just i'm aware with the the conversations going on in the world around us and that just now i'm aware of the privilege and the the status um of of me in real life but also on the page and that that factors in massively into how i wrote that book you know for for anyone that hasn't read it uh, the only guys in the village is brilliantly funny uh, actually it's, it's great and it's good to hear the origin of that the hours and hours on comedians podcasts and stuff um we're goldsmith there you go <laughs> Um, Nick, um, just there, Chris was uh, talking about uh, kind of well, warning about distilling a country into people's lives. Um, but it, in the first story, I think, um, in your book, uh, The Cat in the City, you distill the entire of Tokyo uh, onto the back of one of your, uh, your characters. Uh, I wonder if you talk a little bit about that. Why did you go for that? that image oh um yeah that's that's a good question why did i go for that image like several reasons um one was just that the act of um the act of writing about a city was proving really tough like really difficult and just this you know symphony of of voices the symphony of, of of people um was starting to blow my mind a little. So I, I liked the idea of, um, of the artist, the tattoo artist sort of going mad in, in this attempt to try and depict the city on the back of someone. Um, there are also a couple of other reasons. Um, one was that uh, there's a short, st- a short story by one of my favorite writers, Tanizaki, uh, which is tra- translated in, in, in different, um, it, uh, different titles. It's sometimes the tattooer, it's sometimes uh, tattooer, uh, tattooist or, or whatever. Um, but that, that story, um, I used as a kind of base 
so it, it's a similar setup it's it's a, a, a tattoo artist who becomes obsessed with with a girl and wants to tattoo something on her back but in, in that case it's a spider so it's a slightly different story um i'm also a big fan of science fiction and i really love ray bradbury's collection of stories called the illustrated man which is also a similar concept of tattoos being stories um yeah so that's that's why i went for that yeah it's, it's do you have sorry do you have tokyo tattooed on your back nick <laughs> no i don't I, I i would never ever get a, a tattoo you know i i, I would I mean, I change my opinions on things all the time. So I just, I, I think I would get one and then a week later, I'd be like, what have I done? <laughs> yeah. And you can't, you can't go in the onsen in Japan. That's, that's why I have no tattoos. I love the onsen too much. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a beautiful way to kind of set up the story, just to zoom in in the city though, um, with this tattooist agonizing uh, over this piece of work. And there's a lot of kind of, you put a lot of magic into the, or you tie magic into the, the traditional, the kind of lost art. I was wondering if that, is, if, was that deliberate? Did you really want to explore traditional Japan um, in quite a modern book as well? Yeah, I, one of the weird things is that I, I see this word popping up a lot now, um, magical realism, uh, describing my book. But the weird thing is, is that I'm, I'm like from a family, I, I'm like the black sheep in my family. So all my family are scientists, they're all doctors, engineers, dentists. And I was at the age of 18, I, I, I had to sort of stick up to my parents and say, no, I'm not going to go study dentistry. I want to I be a writer, I want to study English literature, which I don't know why I, I, I did that. Um, but uh, but I come from a very rational, logical background. And really the book for me, I tried to write a book that was scientifically logical and that there was an explanation for everything. Um, and, but it, it's, it's really lovely to see how the readers have brought to life this magic um, in the book that, that really like I didn't intend to write into it. I intended for it to be very, very much grounded in, in realism. Um, but yeah, so that, that I, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of pleasantly happy that people have seen a magic side to things. Um, yeah. To, to be fair, it does start off with a magic cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. But but the idea was always that it could be in his head. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you're saying your your family are are all scientists, and one of your characters is a bit of a mad scientist. That's uh, how, how did that go down? Um. Well. Yeah, so Bob the robot in, in that story, he's based on my older brother. Um, <laughs> he's just, his company, his company have just printed the first um, 3D, 3D printed drivable vehicle in, in Europe. So yeah, Bob was the inspiration behind the 3D printing, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, Chris, you've kind of, well, just to change the subject quite drastically from, uh, from magical realism, uh, the mayor may not be there. Um, Chris, you've touched um, in your book about, or just in the past, and on podcasts and things, and you've touched about how modern Japan has strived forward as one, uh, a united country. But while it might be one country, it's not one race. Um, can you talk a bit more about that and how you've thought about dealing with this diversity in your writing? Sure. Yeah, I think um, it, it's strange for for someone of my generation who grew up on. I used to really love Clive James's uh, travelogues, and if people have seen his work on Japan, and then Jonathan Ross did his Japan series, and all these kind of pop culture uh, explorations of of Japan do kind of have in the background this idea that there is a, to some extent, at least a kind of psychological unity of people in Japan, often they're only talking about um, cities and certain demographics, but the underlying idea was often of a certain kind of similarity, that people will have the same parameters of behavior, see the, the world in a, in a similar kind of way. And although that's a, maybe a social or a cultural idea, the idea has been really popular in Japan, certainly in the modern era, that that is also linked to a homogeneity of race and that we certainly have very little to do with the rest uh, of Asia. 
one of the things that the Japanese have been keen to do at various points in the past is make clear distinctions between Japan and China or Japan and Korean Peninsula or Southeast Asia etc. And you can find that being pushed. Um, there's a quote I think either in, in Japan Story or or the new book, um, you can find Japanese politicians of this generation still saying we are one culture, one language, one race, one nation. Um, and that is still, I encounter that a lot working in Japan, that is still quite a popular idea. Whereas it's been hinted at already in our conversation. I think Nick was saying, you know, going to meeting academics who work on Japan, one thing that gets said over and over again is that there is enormous diversity, yet in terms of race, in terms of neighbourhood and region, attitudes, Japan has class. If you only encounter Japan through um, a lot of the pop culture products of the West, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get the impression that there are different classes in Japan. I remember the first time I saw a, a district of Okayama, I think it was, that was obviously a, quite a run-down part of the city. I thought, this doesn't really look like the Japan that I've grown up imagining. And it can be quite a surprise. So I suppose I wanted to get that sense um, in the book of an enormous diversity of experience and also diversity of what people in Japan would like the word Japan to mean, what they want the associations to be for their country. Because often the people that lead that are um, people at the top of politics or people at the top of media or the tourist board who want to project a certain image of Japan abroad. And the reality is that there's a real fight going on in the background, certainly in the modern era, which is what I study, for people who want Japan to take a very different tack. So the idea, and that's what I suppose looking at people allows you to do, you can look at those sorts of fights over identity, which isn't something that we often associate Japan with. I mean, one of the reasons, perhaps when you were asking earlier on about why I got interested in Japan, one of the really boring things about Japan, I think when I was learning about it, was its uh, politics. I think if you're really into Japan's politics, you can probably find lots to enjoy there. But that lack of a kind of a regular, a reasonably balanced back and forth across an ideological spectrum isn't something that we often associate with Japan. You know, it's the Liberal Democratic Party and its various fringe rivals who keep breaking up and reforming to try and have a, a better stab at fighting the LDP. So for all these reasons, there isn't often in our general understanding uh, of Japan an impression of great diversity, an impression of great contest ideologically over politics and I wanted the book to try to say to readers actually that's not quite true. There's a lot going on in the background that doesn't always filter through but that's worth understanding. I hope that makes sense as a slightly long-winded answer to your, to your question but hopefully that more or less comes together as a response. No, no, that, that, that was great, thank you. And, and anybody else um, wants to ask a question, we're coming into the last 10 minutes, feel free again, just pop them in the chat. Um, but to continue on this uh, kind of topic of um, overlooked stories in a way, um, Nick, you deal quite directly with homelessness in Japan, including in relation to the Tokyo Olympics. Um, earlier this year, the Japanese book club who welcomed the translator uh, of Yu Murray's Tokyo Ueno Station, which also deals a lot with the Olympics and, and homelessness. Um, and there's been quite a bit of um, journalism surrounding this topic too recently. Um, but I wonder what, why in particular did you want to uh, broach this topic in your writing? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and it kind of ties a bit in with what Ian and, and Chris have been saying too, um, particularly with Ian, when Ian was talking about expats and um, immigrants and what Chris was also just talking about, um, Japan and othering. Um, so I think, yeah, one of the things I wanted to do with my book was to take this idea of harmony um, that's often depicted in, in Japanese culture and say, well, I know that that J Japan likes harmony, it likes, it likes accord, it likes everyone saying and, and thinking the same thing. But I know from my experiences living there, when I go to parties and people get drunk and they start to talk to me candidly, that people don't necessarily all agree with each other and there are lots of differing opinions. Um, but I think that this kind of um, human instinct to create an us and them, and in Japanese they would say uchi and soto, it's, it, it comes from that. And I, I always wanted to write a book about people who didn't quite fit in to the status quo, to 
to what was accepted in Japan. Um, and I started writing, I mean, I wrote the story about the homeless guy, Ohashi. I wrote that back in 2016. So this is four years before the Olympics was going to happen. And the reason I started to write that story was because I started to, to think about the city changing. So I wanted the city to change like a character. And I thought that a good way of looking at a changing city was to look at the leading lead up to the Olympics. So, um, and I started to do research on the Olympics in all cities in, in previous years. And there's a common trend that before the Olympics, people do take the homeless out of the CBDs. They do try to clean up, clean up the city. And this also, I mean, this was cut from the book, but also there was, that in, in, in previous Olympic cities, there were also the rounding up of stray dogs and cats and the euthanizing of those stray animals. So I, I kind of wanted to write about like the dark underside of the Olympics and maybe the, the things that, that, that don't get noticed so much and don't get commented on so much because we're thinking more about this great union of, of, of all these different countries coming together. Um, and in response to the Tokyo Ueno Station by Yumiri, which I have a copy of here because I thought you were going to ask that question. So I was, when I found out about this book, I was kind of scared. I was like, oh gosh, we've written about the same thing. Um, so I purposefully didn't read it until after my book had been published. And then I read it and I thought, well, actually, I'm really pleased that we've both picked up on something. And it's no, it's no kind of coincidence that Yu Miri herself is a Zainichi Korean writer. So she's part outsider herself. You know, she's grown up in Japan. Her first language is Japanese, but she has this identity that puts her slightly out of the accepted norm. Um, so I was actually, I mean, I think her book is, is a bit different to mine. I think hers is, is better in, in a lot of ways in, in how it examines this one issue. Um, but I was also kind of pleasantly, I, I don't know. It was one of those moments where I thought, "Oh, that I'm, 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 I'm pleased that I picked up on something there that that actually, you know, coincided with other with another writer's thoughts." Yeah. Oh, it's called Tokyo Ueno Station. So it's um, Ueno is is one of the stations in the north part of Tokyo called. Uh, so it's U E N O Ueno. Nick, I, I want, sorry, can I just cut in? Nick, I, I wanted to ask: um, Did the cancelling of the Olympics force any rewrites? Oh, absolutely not. No, because it had already gone to press. It was there sitting. Because um, the, towards the end of the book, it gets very, very close to saying, like, the Olympics are taking place. It's actually happening. <laughs> but yeah, just stop. No, it. no that, was, that was just an awful time in, in, in early lockdown when my editor was saying, oh, God, they're going to cancel the Olympics. And I was just like, it doesn't matter. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And there, there's a question for, for Chris in the chat here. Nadine, I'm going to unmute you and you can ask it yourself. If you can unmute. Thank you. Well, I would have a question for each of the, the writers. And thank you, because it is very interesting conversation. But I know we don't have much time. And as I myself, I am myself a historian of modern Japan, I thought I would ask Chris a, a question. Um, in spite of the appearances, I, I wrote my PhD not that long ago, but when I started this PhD, I was told, oh, biographies, no, that's, that's not really interesting. Nobody does that anymore. Uh, and, and I see that with your new book, you have, uh, and, and I have myself written about one particular uh, character, uh, but I see that you've chosen to, um, to do this, to write about several people. And I'm wondering um, what you think about this idea of biography being a little bit passe or, or no longer useful, or, and whether uh, you think you're contributing something different or something else by writing a biography, and what is it? Uh, good question, yeah. I, mean, I think I received similar advice when I was applying for research money is that no one does biography anymore, so, you know, at a proper kind of academic level. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think especially if you can have a, a cast of characters, if it's a multi-part biography, um, I think there's something rich about that. But also there's, there are a few ways of getting into a place as rich and promising and dramatic as through individual lives. There's that immediate connection. I mean, you see it in Ian's work and in Nick's work as well from their different points of view. To get in there via people's lives, I think is a wonderful way to do things, to explore. And also as a historian trying to communicate with quite a broad audience, you can smuggle in some of the stuff that 
in an academic book can weigh it down in terms of its architecture mm -hmm. you know theoretical approaches arguments against this or against that you can communicate all that in the context of exploring someone's life um but not in a way that hopefully will end up with people just putting the book down and walking off in disgust. So I think, I think a biography offers you a chance to do so much if it's handled well. If it's simply a mini Wikipedia entry, someone's life, birth to death, then I could see that can be quite uninteresting intellectually. But I think if the possibilities are used well, um, then I think it's a, it's a wonderful way of immersing people as directly as possible into a time and place without being too laborious about your setup. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the question. I think Chris, um, you you do that very well yourself. When in Japan story, I love the fact that every single chapter it starts with this biographical moment. There's like a, a nice story about somebody that's some situation or some character um, that embodies what you're then going to go on to talk about, and you you bring the reader in that way. So it's a really nice way of structuring things. Well, thank you. That's, that's kind of you to say. You always wonder if you think in the end people will feel like I'm uh, indulging myself a little bit too <laughs> too much. But thank you. And that, that's, really, yeah. that's really kind yeah. of you too. It works well. Um, I th I've got one quick question for Ian just before. I think we'll end on uh, Rona's question. That's a great one to end on. Um, but just talking about biographies. Uh, why you said early on you you wrote novels about topics you, you really wanted to learn more about. Why didn't you write a, a novel about a, a gaijin in Japan? Why did you go for the memoir? Because I, I tried to, is the short answer. I tried a couple of times to write, um, to take these stories, the, the kind of my experiences and turn it into a novel. And about 30,000 words in, I realized all I was doing was just masking my own experiences and sort of semi-fictionalizing them and eventually just went this is a waste of time i could just write the actual like the story is the thing that's interesting not how it's framed so i'll just tell the actual story and that's what started the, it started as a column on gaijin pot and it was just me taking these stories and going does this actually just work as a story without me inventing characters and situations and like i had a i had a whole idea about this um, an Irish guy, not a Scottish guy. He's Irish <laughs> and he's moved to Japan. And it was just like, God, it's so thinly veiled and crap. But <laughs> that's the main reason. I have written, not, I wrote one novel entirely set in Japan with Japanese characters. Um, and I showed it to, to my agent and a couple of publishers and they all went, oh God, no, we're not publishing that. That's, it's very, very weird. It's unstructured and Sorry, that, that it is magical realism. We we're talking about that earlier. It's it's a magical realist mess, and everybody who read it went, "Yeah, well done." We're not publishing that, so <laughs> we went with memoir in the end. Um, so just to go to Rona's question to to finish things up, um, how would each person suggest beginning to get to know Japan from afar? She's very fascinated by it, uh, but as yet. Uh, able to go read our books <laughs> <laughs> is the short version <laughs> yeah I, I would be really really biased and I would say read lots of Japanese literature uh, but that's because that's where my interest lies you know I love fiction I love literature so for me but then there's tons of really good non-fiction about Japan too uh, but I think read if you want to write I think the key to, to any kind of writing, be it uh, hi historical writing, memoir or fiction, I think the key is to read lots and lots and lots. Um, and I would just say there's, there's such a rich um, uh, literary history in Japan. There's so many amazing writers. So I, I would suggest, yeah, just, just devour as much literature as you can. I had a couple of suggestions to complement that, hopefully. We are bringing up our children to speak Japanese and we make heavy use of sites like, I think, Drama Crazy or something like that. Japan does contemporary drama, I think, very well. It can all sometimes be a bit cheesy uh, and contrived. And some of these websites, be very careful because you get some of very, very odd pop-up advertising on it. Um, but as a complement to the literature, which is sometimes from the kind of the purer end of literature, something perhaps a bit more... Um, 
not that literature can't be down to earth, but certainly some of this contemporary drama in Japan um, is a lovely way of getting straight into the country. You get the diversity and you get the humour that way. So a lot of that you can find out there online with reasonably good subtitles. Also historical drama, Japan I think does really well. And again, you can find that for free online with subtitles, just careful of the pop-ups. That'd be my tip, I think. Okay, great. And, and Nadine has also put uh, to run it to read Roland Barthes, The Empire of the Saints. Ooh, good choice. Uh, oh, I didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any writers out there that do like Roland Bart? <laughs> I've fought with him on a number of occasions. <laughs> what would be your suggestion, Ian, for getting into Japan? Um, apart from my flippant one at the start. Yeah, I'm, I, I agree with all of that. I read, read the literature, read the history. Um, George Sansom. Samson, I'm going to forget his name. Um, Chris Hart, Chris, you know, you're the historian. Um, George Samson's um, trilogy of history books about Japan um, are what I started with. And they're, they get dry in places, but they're generally very, very good. Um, and I hope Chris is not now about to say that they're all being debunked or anything like that. Um, right. Yeah, they're, they're good books. Um, things like, I mean... <sighs> Things like the, the Ghibli films, uh, Miyazaki Hayao films, are, are great because um, they show a certain, a certain viewpoint um, that is, is popular in Japan. You know, they're, they're Japanese films that are popular here um, and are, are popular outside Japan and, and can give a certain access into values and, and society and things like that. Um, I thought the um, recent series Giri Haji on BBC and Netflix, that, that was very, very good. Very nice. Um, when Chris was talking earlier about um, Japanese identity and their relationship with, uh, with China and sort of mainland Asia, I couldn't help thinking about uh, the similarities between two island nations who have slightly problematic relationships with the, the continent nearby. And, and Giri Haji is a very, very good em embodiment of that of that similarity so yeah can i i know we're, we're out of time but i don't want to be too long but the, the last thing i might add is to as far as possible go for breadth there are so many different angles that you could take on japan that are out there you know from literature film drama cuisine meeting people sport all the rest of it um don't get don't get stuck on just one I think try and get a sense of that breadth. That's what's so fascinating. It's endlessly broad, and there's so much out there available now. Um, so as far as possible, yeah, I would try and get yourself a, a good breadth and make your own decisions about what Japan is like as a place. Let's start with our books, and start with our books. Yes, please. Yeah, two or three copies a piece. Yeah. Uh, so just to wrap things up, thank you so much uh, to all our attendees. Uh, thank you to uh, the Stay at Home Fringe Literary Festival for hosting us again. Um, and thank you, of course, to our panellists. And just to echo uh, Ian again, do read. Uh, Ian's the only gaijin in the village. Do read Nick Bradley's The Cat in the City. And do read Chris Harding's Japan Story and the upcoming The Japanese A History in 20 Lamps. Um, yeah, and, and thank you so much. This, this has been recorded. Um, so I'll put it up on the Japanese Book Club um, YouTube channel. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Um, and I'll tweet about that later on too. Uh, you can all access this again, share with your friends, stuff like that. But thank you again so much to everybody, to our panelists and attendees. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Cheers. Yeah, thank you, Reese, for organizing and hosting it. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, and thanks everyone for joining as well. Cheers. Uh, take care, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. It's Saturday night in Japan. <laughs>
cool thank you I, I hope you enjoy it um yeah yeah it's it should be available in all good bookshops but uh corona has i don't know if you've had that amazon's been bizarre recently with um like amazon japan has decided my book was unpublished um so it was published in march they were selling it happily and then a couple of weeks ago i went on and it was like this or this book will be released at the end of november please pre-order now okay uh, that's weird yeah yeah it's like they, they can't get stock because of corona and staff shortages and things but rather than just saying we're out of stock they've said it hasn't been published yet yeah i, I remember it sort of in